you're listening to the Epic Universe Podcast. For more information on the Epic series of novels, visit www.epicuniverse.com. Loading personality, Stephanie Police, Derek Collins, Initiating Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Epic Universe Podcast. We were on hiatus last week um, because of um, Mother's Day, so welcome back. We have uh, somebody interesting on with us today. We actually have Lee with us. Um, we're going to pick his brain, find out um, what was going through his head when he was writing uh, The Glorious Becoming, get some feedback from him and ask him some questions and probe his brain. Oh, who's Lee? It's some guy that y'all picked up somewhere who, you know. I mean, he says that he's, he says that he's the one that wrote the epic <laughs> series. I'm not. I'm oh, not that Lee. That Lee. Yeah, that, uh, that, that might be That's really the cool. one. Right. <laughs> Derek, we have the author of our favorite series on the podcast. I didn't know if you got the memo, but this is what we're doing tonight. No, see, Derek's upset because I, I, I cracked the, uh, a Falcons joke before we started recording. Oh, so, he's all bummed. Uh, yeah, he's all bummed. Well, I'm I'm kind of speechless, but I I'm just keep thinking about those bounty paper towels. Oh, whatever. Okay, you know? well, I'm I'm gonna get this I'm gonna get this runaway train back on track. <laughs> let's let's get on track. <laughs> All right. So how about since since he's throwing a temper tantrum, Derek? How about you ask the first question? Warning: You are now entering a spoiler zone. Do not proceed until properly briefed. Uh, uh me ask the first question. Okay, okay. Um, Lee. You know that your fans love your books, and we, we go through them at a fever pitch every time you release one. Um, what took so long for us to get the glorious becoming? First off, it is huge. <laughs> it is a big it's, book. It's a big book. It's my first 500-plus page book. Kudos um, to that, by the way. Sure. I hope I never do that again. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because when you look at you know Dawn of Destiny and Outlaw Trigger back then, those seem like pretty normal lids. But now, like the Glorious Becoming is almost the size of both of those books combined. So the stories have gotten so much so much longer, and part of that's because there are so many established characters. I can't if I'm writing a battle scene. I can't just, you know, leave half the crew over here while Scott does his thing. I have to focus on everybody. So that makes things a little bit longer to write. That takes a little more time. But um, a bigger factor than that, this was a complicated book. And, and you guys read it. Um, you guys know all the different elements and all the things that have to tie in. And, God, it was just such a complex thing to write, especially with the, the timing issues of, of Richmond and Cairo Nova Sibirsk, you know, all of these areas have different things going on, but they have to match up chronologically. And that, that took a very long time to do. How do, how do you do something like that? I mean, do, do you get your paper out and you say, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, and, and just start labeling things out? Do you make charts? How, how does that work? Uh, a little bit of all of that. Um, I do like to scribble on a notepad. I do have Word documents and, and notepad documents all over my computer, but my favorite way to flesh something out is with an ink pen and just a tablet. And so I'll sit down and I'll, I'll write, you know, Nova Sibiris with a down arrow with little bullet points. You know, this happens here, this happens here. Then next to that I'll have uh, Richmond with a down arrow. And, and, and you're kind of shifting things up and down to make everything line up. And... You know, that, that's a, a big part of the planning stage, but most of the fine-tuning comes as you're writing and you figure out what doesn't work. Uh, let's see if I can come up with an example. Okay, uh, for Cairo. They're, they're in Cairo for, for three days, story-wise, so things are moving fast. I would have loved to have stayed in Cairo for two weeks, but the other areas don't allow that to happen. You have uh, the whole event with, with Richmond and Archer, you know, finding out that Lylan and uh, Falcon Platoon, you know, may have this information that could blow his cover and whatnot. And uh, when he finds out this information, he's not going to just sit on it 
for you know a, a month. He's going to do something right now. We're going to solve the problem right now. Well, that right now also affects Nova Sibiris. It also affects Cairo. So you don't have all of this free time. You're not working with three different places independent of one another. They all tie in. And, um, you know, a lot of scribbling, a lot of trial and error, a lot of writing a scene and looking and saying, you know what, this doesn't work. I have to speed this up. I have to stretch this out. I have to make this line up. And so, uh, and, and that also definitely contributed to how long this thing took. No, no doubt. Sounds like the timeline was kind of the skeleton of, of the book where everything's got to be con- connected and, and you got to build on top of that your, in your muscles. That's a great you way to put it. Finally get the skin on it. Yeah, I really can't think of a better way to describe it than that. Uh, I started with that and uh, just kind of built around that to try and accomplish the things that I needed to accomplish for the uh, plot progression. Well, I'd say you did create a monster when you wrote this book, so... <laughs> Yeah, I won't be upset if the next books are shorter. <laughs> you, you know what, though, Lee? Um, I, I didn't have a problem with the size, and, and the reason was because by the end of the book, I was wishing it was longer. But, you know, that's going to happen if you write 700 pages, you know. You, the, the end always leaves you wanting for more. Um, and I felt like... Uh, just from my memory, I got through the glorious becoming faster than I got through the first one, which which would mm. maybe that would sound odd, but you know it's very very easy to read. So it really, even though it's it's a big book, it really doesn't you know feel like that when when you've gotten to the end of it. It doesn't read like a big book because you've built up us up with so much anticipation and you've left so much unanswered in the first in the first few that you say you kind of see a little tidbit like so much is going to be answered. There's this going on. There's this going on, and then you just kind of like cut off the information flow, and it's like you're jonesing for your next fix. So you pick up the book and you're getting all of this information that you've been aching for for the entire first three books, and then all of a sudden you're just you want to absorb it all at once. So it didn't read like it was a long book. It, it went fairly quickly, Lee, and it was exemplary exemplary writing. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I think I think a lot of the, the speed of it has to do with just the momentum that's been built up from the first three books and not having to dedicate a lot of time to explaining what the Bakba are, what is Eden Command. Everybody knows this already, so we can get right to the plot. You know, that, that, makes, things, that makes things fly. Um. This may be the fastest last hundred pages of any book in this series, <laughs> uh, just because uh, there's so much happening. I think that makes it go a lot, a lot faster. I think when you get there to to those last hundred pages, when you're reading it, you better hope you don't have to be anywhere. <laughs> I took an extra long lunch when I was <laughs> reading the last few pages because of my it's 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 almost impossible to say, well, I can stop here. Because when you reach that point, there's no going back. It's like, well, I, well I'm finishing it now. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm not going to put the book down. And that really is like a fifth of the entire book is the last event. So that's a lot. It's a lot of text. All right. Well, in, in terms of everything that happened in the book, I, I have mm-hmm. to ask, how hard did you laugh when you listened to our predictions and you knew that <laughs> none of them were correct, it was like, except with like maybe two? <laughs> well, let, let's see. Let me uh, bring up the, all the predictions because some of them I definitely want to comment on. Uh, and, and I have to declare I have to declare a winner. I mean, come on. Well, I'm looking I, I, forward. I, I, I feel to like that. I'm gonna. Con- I feel like I'm gonna concede to this one because I think that I had like two. <laughs> well, now, I mean, well, I know one of them was correct, and I don't. I think like one of them was kind of correct. All right, so I have you guys' uh, predictions right here. The 14th will be split between Nova Scotia and Richmond. The race for Earth is more about humanity. Blake will succeed. Uh, succeed Pauling, and Oleg will die. Those were yours, Derek. And I have to say. Your prediction that Blake would succeed Pauling was spot on, and it was also like the worst prediction you could have made. <laughs> I basically said that in book three. Way to go. <laughs> that shouldn't even be fair. 
Um, <laughs> I'm cool. I'm cool with taking that one out. I'm cool with. I'm cool with giving that one. <laughs> but you, you didn't know. Th- we didn't know if that was going to happen in book four or not. Though. You also thought that that Esther was Archer's daughter, which okay. would have had Archer, you know, <laughs> starting young to say the least, since he's in his thirties. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, that'll be another I've, edit. I've defended myself on this issue. <laughs> Basically, Derek, I, I think you've eliminated yourself. <laughs> I think you've eliminated yourself from contention here. I do think the race for Earth is a power play between the aliens. That's something Stephanie said. And you know what? Uh, maybe so. Uh, the Nightmen, Scott will divide, destroy the Nightmen. Wasn't Scott, but you definitely see the Nightmen take a hit. Uh, Scott and Sveta's future will be determined. You know, I, I think, I think, Derek, I hate to break it to you, but I think, I think the Esther prediction killed you. Yeah. I know the Esther prediction <laughs> killed me. That's why I said Stephanie was brilliant. <laughs> and, and I felt <laughs> <laughs> my Athene mind powers once again. Don't and hate. Now, don't hate. And now. You see that she's admitting to it. So I'm, yeah. I'm embracing it. You guys have branded <laughs> me with it. I'm going to embrace it. <laughs> I do love uh, your prediction about um, Max is going to kill Oleg because I was thinking, oh, he, he's going to think when he's reading what, what's in this book, he's going to be like, I got it. I got it. I was and, wondering. I was sitting there. It's like, oh, my gosh. Ah, <laughs> it. Wow. I gotta be honest. I gotta be honest, Derek. I was rooting for you there. I was, I was like, come on, come on, really? come on. Nothing. <laughs> I was really hoping that he was gonna get taken out. I'm not gonna lie. It, it really almost wasn't fair to have predictions for this book because I think this book goes in such a different direction from any other book before it. So it's any prediction that was close, you know, was, was pretty good. So y'all both did very well. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think y'all both did a fantastic. Do. It was it was fun to do. Um, I, I, you know, next next time around, let's do it again. You know, it's a, uh, it's fun to think about those things. I'm it not is. sure we'll ever really nail one, just because of the unpredictability factor. But uh, I enjoyed doing it. That's good. It, it was. It's always interesting to hear, you know, what people think is going to happen. It, it's kind of a measuring stick for me that I can look at and say. Okay, here's what I am portraying to fans and readers. Here's kind of where I've been leading them, and it, it kind of can help me get an idea of, of how how uh, what's the right way to to put it? How I'm coming across? Am I coming across in the right way that I want to? And you know, it's always a poor thing to lead someone down random rabbit trails and whatnot. Uh, but every, everything that you guys predicted made, made you know, total sense uh, in the context of, of what could have happened in the story. So I thought you guys did fantastic with it. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I have a, another another question. This one, this one, when I read it, it um, uh, stirred up an emotion that I'm. I was. I, I had to put the book down and walk and, and walk away. Um, why did you decide to go in the direction you did with the relationship between Varya and, and the jerk? I'm branding him the jerk because I can't even say his name without getting angry. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I had to put it down and walk away because it just made me so mad. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a very, a very powerful uh, series of events. And uh, I love that previously... Uh, in the, the last podcast, you guys talked about different elements of that that you focused on uh, with, with you, Stephanie, really focusing on Varvara and the impact on her. And Derek looking at, you know, let's, this is Dostoevsky's growth and how he responded to it. I love that you guys are able to, to pick up two different things there. But it's difficult to answer what makes me want to do something like that because I never go into something saying, Okay, this character well, absolutely has to. Well, let, let me rephrase. Maybe yes, what, okay. when when did you decide that there had to be some type of break in Varya's misery? Because I mean, it was it was clear that she was just. 
right. uh, absolutely uh, like miserable in in her situation with this. I mean, it was terrible what happened to her. But was it kind of like your decision to stop her from being the leper of 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 the fourteenth? Like was that well, was that like an outlet almost for her and a kind of a way to tie in Dostoevsky's redemption at the same time? Well, it, it kind of points toward one of the uh, general themes in Epic is that you can't judge a book by its cover. It's easy to, to in book one to write Dostoevsky off, you know, and then into book two with what he does. It's easy to say this guy is scum. You know, I can't wait for him to get get the axe. But you never know a person's potential. You never know what a person is going through. You never know what outside influences to them that you don't know about are creating who they are and, you know, how they act. And so it's very easy to, obviously using Barbar as an example, to look at someone like that and saying, boy, this is just a superficial uh, this is just a superficial person who is, you know, running around, cheating on uh, her man and, and getting in all this immoral activity. But you don't know what's what's going on with them. And I try to I try to touch on those things as often as I can. I never force them. If the story heads in a way that allows me to do that in a, a, a tasteful and way that makes sense, then, you know, that's a that's a. A wonderful thing to be able to do, uh, but it, it just it felt like where her story was going. You know, I I don't think anyone really expected Victor to be boyfriend of the century or anything uh, like that, uh, even prior to to this book. And so, you know, it, it fit his character, uh, and it fit her character to have that that outward appearance of superficiality but deep inside be dealing with some some serious some serious issues not the least of which is you know self-confidence i think that is something that a lot of of young women struggle with and, and young women deal with and she's in this relationship even though it's a a harmful and negative relationship because she still feels like there's this part of her that's saying he loves me. And, you know, obviously that, you know, looking at it as a neutral third party, you know that's not the case. But, yeah, so I guess that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question. I think that's a makes, – uh, makes it more real, makes the book more real. I think we can look at our relationships in life – and we can look at our social groups and, and, and how people view other people. And the true is it, – it's true for every person. And it, it makes me wonder about some of the other characters in the book that we look at as, as being uh, bad or distasteful or, or for whatever they do. It makes me wonder more about their character, about well, what has happened to them. Or what's going on that, that we haven't had insight in? You know, right. what's what's happened to Victor to make him the way he is? You know, right? Because um, we can look at other people as being monsters, but then if we take a step in their shoes, we we can often understand, or maybe try to get a, a better chance to understand why they do what they do, even if it's not right, right what they do. And and that's real life that's real life things. I think we all can relate to that. I can't relate to Victor and I hope he gets eaten by a Ken Rassi. Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Um I, 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 I think that it's I think that it's a, it is a great a great way to kind of personify the book about things not not being, you know, always what they seem on the outside. Like I I, I thought it was a twist beyond all twists that um, Tothin rescued Sveta. I thought that was very, very surprising. Like my jaw dropped. I had to read that set, that 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 section uh, a few times over to really let that sink in. Oh, that that was a fun scene to write. Anything with uh, with Tothin is just a blast to write because he's such an untapped character of extreme depth. 
that we're just getting to right now. He is frighteningly um, intelligent. Oh, he's extremely intelligent. Well, he's a he is a, a supervisor in the uh, in the Bakma ranks. Um, you know, Tothin uh, is a supervisor's name. It's it's kind of a, a captainship type name because as we as we discovered, Bakma are not named based on what their parents want to name them. Uh, they're named based on their function. So he's he's very intelligent. Uh, he has. He's he's always thinking. He's he's always looking at the big picture. He can see the forest for the trees pretty much at all times, and that makes him an intriguing character. It makes him a dangerous character, but also a character that you pull for. So he's got a great mix of uh, of elements there. Uh, he he is one of my favorite characters to write. It's often. He he seems like he's interest. He's fun. He's interesting. I have to ask this. Within the timeline of the book, with the mm-hmm. last hundred pages, when Tothan is rescuing Sveda, at the same time, we have the Golothok centurion that's rescuing Esther. You planned it that way, correct? Of course. That was... <laughs> that was of hard. course. I mean, that... And, and the characters are so different. You know, one's a Backman, one's, uh, one's a Ceratopian or a Golothok. <laughs> Tothan just touched on his intellect. Um, I wouldn't say Centurion. You know, Centurion's uh, not an intellectual creature, but he's he's more brute force. Right. It's more which which is. Uh, I just love the way that worked out. I loved how you have two entirely different characters, two alien species, and yet they're at war with each other, but. At the same time, they're acting in similar ways for members of the there, team. There were a lot of parallels between what was going on at, at Nova Sibirsk and what was going on at Cairo. I mean, even so far as at the same time, you're having these alien breakouts. Uh, you know, one is caused in Cairo by an outside uh, factor, which is Scott and his crew, uh, while the other is being caused uh, by. Tothan essentially busting his guys out, but they're still being impacted from the outside by Eden. So uh, there, there are a lot of parallels between um, the two different uh, sides of the, the final big, big battle. Would you say... Big that, battle, big escape slash battle. Would you say that uh, in writing this series, one of your goals was to create a lot of parallels? I've seen... Uh, numerous parallels within the series. Mm, you you take advantage of those opportunities when they present themselves, but you you don't force them. You don't go into it saying I'm going to create a parallel. What you do is as as you're writing the story and as as the events are unfolding as they would in a way that makes logical sense, you just keep your eyes open for any time where hey, you know what this this could be a really neat thing to have lined up. This could be a really neat thing to have work out. So it's, it's more being aware of when those opportunities present themselves than sitting back and saying, okay, I'm going to make this work out this way. Uh, if I stuck to the exact plan, uh, then there'd be no room for inspiration, and I don't think the books would be half as entertaining uh, as they uh, hopefully are to be. So as 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 a reader, you know, as I would r- read those things, I would wonder, you know, as a writer, was this his intention? And and you say it's more along the lines of inspiration. So when you're going into to writing a book, do you have certain set goals that that, that are few? Um, do you have like a bullet list? Do you have these are the things that I want to happen in this book? And you just stick to a few things and let your inspiration run. How does that work? Because as as, as a reader, I'm not a writer. I don't have uh, I, I don't have the mind of, of a writer as as a fictional writer. Uh, um, re- give us a little insight into a writer's brain on, on how a book like The Glorious Becoming uh, comes to be what it is. Well, you really hit the nail on the head you know, in a way. There, you always start with the big point of the book. Uh, For example, I knew 
uh, originally I would love for Dawn of Destiny to have been Dawn of Destiny and Outlaw Trigger into one book, but it just would not have been uh, as as it would have been way too long, and I, I think book one served as an introduction well. But I knew you know book two this is this is Scott's this is Scott's fall. This is the book where Nicole has to die. This is the book where you see Scott become a nightman. I knew in book three, this is where Svetlana returns. And I knew she'd return in book three when I finished book one. This is where she comes back. This is where it's kind of established that, you know, regardless of, of how they ultimately end up, they're being set up as the, the male and female romantic leads. Um, and so I knew book three is going to be a redemption story. I knew book three would have the uh, the golden collar because I really wanted to have that essence of the golden lion plus plus uh, the, the darkness of the nightman. And same thing with book four. I knew this would be the Cairo book. I knew this would be the book where uh, Outlaw Trigger makes sense, as you said in the, the last uh, podcast. So you have those big bullet points that you really know, you know, this is going to happen. But the spaces in between that you give yourself a lot of room to to let inspiration guide you, to let let yourself uh, really feel where the story is going. The best way I can, I can think to describe it, and hopefully this makes sense, um, this was actually, I can't take credit for this, it was another uh, writer who uh, first uh, told me this. Um, writing a book is like driving, you're driving through the woods, on a winding road, and far in the distance you see this tall, tall lighthouse. And you know I'm going to that lighthouse, but you don't know where the road's going to go to get you there, but you know that's where you're going. So it's kind of an experience like that, and I think that's the, the best way to write. But I'm sure you know other people, every writer is different, so I'm sure there are some who have everything structured and um, you know, just they, they're hitting all of the bullet points. The, the big ones, the small ones, just boom, boom, boom. Uh, but that's not how that that's not a, a style that really suits me as much. When, when I come to to the end of the book, uh, it it, it re- everything fits together so well that it gives you know me the impression that you had everything planned out. And, and I think it's just it's uh it's cool to hear you say how you come across it, but but it it just comes together like a puzzle, and and for me I'm reading it thinking, gosh, well he planned this out really well. So so um, well there there is a lot of that. It's it's kind of a, a mix of of both things. Um, things definitely take me by surprise. For example, uh. Esther Brooking even existing, you know, she was not a character in in Outlaw Trigger. Uh, it was just a, a regular uh, girl from the states, and uh, she was just a, a generic soldier. And the inspiration struck. Hey, you know what? This is an opportunity to put in this kind of character here, and that would be that'd be pretty interesting. Let's see where this can go. And so, inspiration affects your plan. As she got plugged in, different avenues opened up. Uh, and you work you work those things into the story, and you make them connect, and you make everything make sense. That's really what it's about. It's about making everything make sense, so that uh, when you're reading something, it seems natural. It seems like, well, this is happening because this is what should happen next. Uh, now, I, I like to say uh, some some writers have asked me, you know. How do you know what to write next? And I say, you know, what what should happen next is what would happen next. And that's the best way to stay on track and make sense and make everything connect. And you, you can't lose sight of all of the different factors that are coming into play. I can't write the Cairo escape scene. I can't write what Esther's doing without knowing Boris's history. Because his reactions are a part of him as a, as a person, as an individual. And so he's not just going to be a convenient character device to, you know, make things work out for Esther. You know, he's, he has his own thoughts, which affects how he does his job, which affects 
you know, what's going on with, with her and how she's able to be helped. And so you have to always keep all of those things in mind for all of the different characters. And that's really how things line up. And, uh, you know, some, some things line up, uh, come, come quicker than others. Some ideas flush out, like, just in an instant. Some take a little bit longer to, you know, really sit, really sit back and go, huh, I gotta, how, how is this gonna work? But, you know, if you, if you're open to letting your inspiration guide you, then, you know, all of those things, you know, they, they, they come to. You're, you're so passionate about, about everything that you talk about, Lee, and about how you wrap everything together. It's, it, it's, it, I can tell that you are very much in love with this story. But that being said, was there any part in The Glorious Becoming that, y- that you didn't enjoy writing? Like, was there any part that you knew that you had to do it, but, like, was, like, your least favorite part of the story? Like something Easily. Which, Easily. Which part? Uh, Esther and Scott, without a doubt. Partially because these are, these are it, always, it hurts to write a hard thing happening to a character. So anytime that you're writing, you know, a, a character going through something traumatic or a character dying that you, that you love, you know, that always makes it difficult. But when I originally had the, the little the book points for book four, the way Esther and Scott ultimately turned out in book four with their little journeys wasn't exactly the original thing that I thought, you know, this could probably happen or, you know, maybe this is the, the, the best way for this course to go. And the original idea, you know, didn't work. It frustrated me. Uh, and it just, it wasn't connecting with me. If it doesn't connect with me, it's absolutely not going to connect with people who are reading. And so that took a while to really have to several times take a step back and go, okay, what is going on with these two? How, how do they need to line up to make this work? Uh, so that was difficult. Uh, <laughs> The swamp mission was a pain in the butt. <laughs> oh my goodness! The, the the original getting shot down, uh, the original Falcon platoon when, when they got uh, when they crashed. This is before uh, Sveta and Toffin and Oleg go there in the Nova. Just the the shooting down and what's going on with them when they're on the ground. That might have taken a year. Just that might have taken a year. That's that's not a joke. Uh, it was a pain just to make it make it work but you know you have to keep going at it and going at it and going at it if something doesn't work right take a step back maybe do something else for a little while come back to that and go okay where where does this stand where does it need to be how do we get it there so those two things probably uh esther and scott's story arc and the uh the entire interception of Falcon Platoon were, were very big challenges to get done correctly. Is it tough for you to to write a scene where a character like Major Tacker dies? Yeah, that was uh, side note. Not happy about that. WTF, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Not cool. Uh, no, it's not. It's not hard at all. <laughs> no, it's uh, yes and no. If it's the right thing to happen, it's not hard. If it if it's if it's what's supposed to happen, then you know what, this makes the story better. But there's also that element of knowing I'm I'm not going to write a scene with this character again. And, you know, that, that's very hard because with, with every single character in this, this uh, series, you know, I have so many future conversations that they're having with other characters and, and funny remarks and, you know, just interesting little things that aren't necessarily major plot points, but just cute little scenes or, or hilarious little scenes. And Sprinklers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if, if I kill off someone, it's kind of like you're extinguishing a little flame. You're, everything that you thought, boy, it would be awesome to do this with that character, you're pretty much erasing that and saying, you know what, I'm making the decision that their death is more important to the story than all of these other 
these other things. And so in, in that way, it's hard. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways, when it's the right thing to happen, you, you feel, I'm, I'm going to come off, sound like a heartless person. You feel, <laughs> you feel good about it. You feel good about it because you know what it's going to accomplish. I love, uh, Derek, that you pointed out about the last conversation that Tacker and Lylan had about how uh, his girlfriend is getting back together with him. Uh, Tacker's girlfriend is getting back together. And I knew when Tacker dies, there's going to be an, an emotional sucker punch that is going to work so well for the reader's emotions to get them lined up with where I want them to be in the story. It's going to tick them off. But you know what? They're going to be ticked off at Archer. They're going to be ticked off at what's going on. They're going to be ticked off at the unfairness of this entire situation. And that's going to make them want to turn that next page and turn that next page. And so you know, it, parts of it's difficult. Parts of it's refreshingly easy when you know it's the right decision. But, uh, yeah, you know, every, uh, every, every death has to be approached with a certain level of reverence for the character. You, you're not just, at least not to me and hopefully not to the readers, it's not just a name, some, some text on a page that's getting you know, erased for the rest of the series. You know, it's a person. It's a person who had dreams, had expectations, was going somewhere, and you know, now they're dead. And so there, there has to be that impact. And when that impact is, is uh, the right thing for the right moment, then you know, it, it has to be done. That, that being me. said, um, sorry, Derek, did you want to go? Briefly, I'll, I'll say that um, that scene, the, the Tacker Lylan conversation, their last words to each other, exemplifies writing that when you read it, you don't understand how good it is until you get to the scene later. And, and for me, that's a moment where when Tacker dies, you put the book down for a second and you think back to that scene. But go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, okay, I have okay. followed that. Thank you. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, this is going to be like, I don't know, Will Smith going after Gandhi. Good job. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> in, in the aspect of, I guess, being reflective and approaching each person's death with a sense of reverence, how did you approach the asteroid effect of knocking out the machine like how did you how did you approach killing Thor like that's it's that was a big deal that was one of those that was one of those moments where I had to I had to put the book down and I had to think about all of the all of the stuff that that he he made it through to actually be brought down by what he considered the vermin that he stepped on. That was... I'm, I'm willing uh, to bet that you had to rewrite that part a few times. Because I would have. I would have had don't, to. <laughs> don't take that bet. Uh, don't take that bet. Don't take that bet. You had it planned no. out? I, I had it planned out. Uh, it's it sort of... See, at what point did it strike me? You know what? This is, this is the last ride of General Thor. I think it was when, probably about midway through the 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 writing phase, probably of of, of uh, book four, where I realized, you know what, this is about to this is about to turn on Thor. This whole situation is about to backfire on him. Uh, like like I, I mentioned earlier, I have to let inspiration guide me. Because that's when you get your your best ideas don't come when you're sitting at the keyboard typing. They come at two in the morning when you you know you, you wake up and you're like whoa this would be great. They, you know sunrise when you're getting in from you know uh, a night shift or something. Uh, that's when you know these ideas come. And the idea for Thor getting taken out the first time it popped in my head. It was kind of like, man, could that actually happen? 
could, could I actually go through with that and have that work for the series? Because this is Thor. This is the terror. This is Novosibirsk, the nightmare. Right. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more it dawned on me, this is what has to happen. This has to be the next step because this is what would happen in a real-life situation. You've got Nova Sibirsk who's been picking a fight with Eden for the longest and the longest and the longest, and, and they've got this, this essence of uh, we're unstoppable, we're awesome, uh, this bravado about them, this arrogance. They're one base on a planet. So if Eden just had just cause, they could flatten everything. They could wipe out any, any trace that the Nightmen ever were a presence. Because you're talking about America declaring war on Rhode Island or something. You know, it's just, you can't, you can't stop that no matter how good you are. And so the moment that Archer had his just cause... I knew he is going to finish this job. He is not going to let. He's put in all of this effort to, to get rid of this, this obstacle that he sees in Thor. He's getting this job done. And it made perfect sense for Klaus Ferber to be the one who uh, killed Thor. Uh, that really had to be something that was approached, you know, in in a way that was respectful to the character that Thor was. You know, if, if, uh, if Thor's death would have been, you know, uh, Flopper bites his shoelace and he, he trips off a cliff, you know, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. So th there, there had to be something where, you know what, this is appropriate for the character. And Klaus Ferber taking that shot was appropriate. And it, it was respectful to Thor, that it took that for him to ultimately fall. Uh, and I think that says something about Thor, too. Uh, don't, you know, I, I would tell people who say, wow, he really, he really went down easy. This was a guy who was fighting off the world and would have escaped if not for a freak prison break with Toth and, and his crew. And even with that said, it took Klaus to pull that trigger. And so, you know, the more I thought on that and dwelled on that, the more I realized, you know, this has to be done. This has to be the next step. This is going to do so much for the story. This is going to lead to so much speculation as to what in the world happens now. The world is suddenly different because Thor is dead. And I think if Thor's death would have come in the last chapter of the last book, you wouldn't be able to look back at the Thor era. Now in book six and seven, you'll be able to go, wow, I remember the world with Ignatius Van Thor. And I think that's kind of something special. It's kind of turning the page in a chapter in history in this, this world. When, when I read that part of the book, I could say I could compare... Compare it to another event, and I, I can compare it to Nicole's death. In that, when you get there, and 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 in outlaw trigger, Nicole's death of course leads to Scott becoming a nightman. At that point, you realize, wait a minute, this series is going somewhere I never thought it was. Mm -hmm. And those are the those are two dramatic turning points or two deaths that that you personally I, I didn't see it coming I don't, I don't know how many people would have saw it coming let's say after you've read dawn of destiny i didn't see nicole's death coming I, but now that i you, you did stephanie I, I i had to i had to figure it in 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 this sense that nicole being uh, in in nova sibirsk it just it just it seemed it seemed like they're just as soon as she stepped foot on that base, something about it, when I read that, just I felt like she wasn't going to leave. She wasn't going to leave alive, for, for that matter, just because yeah. there was Scott had so much potential as, as a character and as a soldier without her that she, she, just, she, she, couldn't, she couldn't leave Nova Spears. 
Right. I was specifically um, speaking of when, you know, when we get to the last page of, of, of Dawn of Destiny and I'm thinking about this series and then you get Outlaw Trigger and you begin to read and this happens early in the book and you think, wait a minute. Boy, this story is going to be a whole lot different than I would have suspected. And the same thing with Thor. You're like, you're like, whoa! I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning Thor being there to to the end, right? And in this moment happens, you're like, I'm at this point again where this story's going somewhere. I have no idea now. And now, and it makes me, it makes me wonder, when's it going to happen again? You know, <laughs> but, but um, I, I, I agree with Julie. I mean, I, I I think now it gives people a lot more to think about. And and you you mentioned taking great care with writing someone's death. Do you are you ever writing with the intention that someone is going to die, and you're writing, you're saying, wait a minute, you know. This shouldn't happen, or this character needs to be around. It's not right for us to lose this character. Yes, uh, that has actually happened twice. Uh, the first time, which I will I will talk about. Uh, the second, I will not. Um, the uh, <laughs> the first time was with Jaden at the end of Dawn of Destiny. Jaden died heroically in the final battle. And I wrote that scene, and I probably left it that way for all of two minutes before I realized, you know, this just, that he, it's not, if his time is going to come, it's not right now. He's too good a character. He's too, uh, had nothing to do with me liking him and, you know, not wanting to, uh, kill off a character that I just liked. I felt like he offered too much to the story. He was too great a potential contributor to everything that could happen to just have, you know, go that quickly. And so, you know, he was definitely one. And uh, the other, which I will not go into detail about, actually was in The Glorious Becoming. Uh, a character death was narrowly averted because it just didn't, it wasn't right for what was taking place at that time. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know how shocking a character death it would be, but, uh, and I don't know if it'll, if it'll happen. Uh, the time was not right in book four for it to happen if it happens at all. So, um, you know, we'll see. So that, that's two characters who have, uh, who have um, narrowly escaped the clutches of my merciless writing style. <laughs> Lee writes like the movie's final destination. It's when is it coming for you? <laughs> when is it coming? <laughs> when is yeah. it going to happen? You avoided it this time. <laughs> it, it's funny. Uh, they, uh, they, have, uh, they used to have those old Netflix commercials where, you know, the... the all the different movie characters are sitting in a, a waiting room and they get called. And I'm thinking, like, any character who says, hey, we got a job for you. You're going to be an epic. they got to be like, crap. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm Total <kidding>. death wish. <laughs> it's the worst series to get, uh, to get adopted into. <laughs> so Note to self, don't accept a movie role if Lee ever offers it to you. You will die. <laughs> that My very favorite. <laughs> My favorite new character of the book was Centurion, and uh, Natalie. That was, was that was me falling out of say, my Lee, What are you doing? Like, <laughs> was it that surprisingly? <laughs> no, that, that was me knocking over my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're like building something on the other end of the line. Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm what all, are you doing? I'm, all, I'm always uh, uh, working on something. <laughs> <laughs> This is me awkwardly trying to reach for a, a bottle of water uh, from the fridge because I ran out of my glass of water. So, dragging the cord of the computer with me. <laughs> hey, I, I'm, we're a little, yeah, we're, we're a little different down here in Louisiana. <laughs> I'm glad there were no casualties. Just... No, no, thankfully no. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and on that note, be very careful with your steps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For for our sake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Centurion is great. I love writing Centurion scenes. He is so he's. <sighs> there are moments in epic that I call hell yes moments, and. Centurion is like hell yes potential to the extreme. I think uh, the moment where he he puts on that armor for the first time and he 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 passes one of those tables where they just have you know neutron weapons and whatnot just laying out because you know a jailbreak is the last thing they expect and he comes around that corner and and you know there's necrolids coming after Esther. She thinks she's toast. She's kind of like oh boy and the necrolids skid. And she looks back to see what they see, and here comes this big Hulk around the corner. Uh, yeah. That that is one of my favorite moments in the entire series. Uh, I get goosebumps. That is a great like, moment. Picturing that. Who has seen um, Avengers? Have you seen Avengers yet? I have not seen Avengers. Okay, you said a Hulk coming around that corner because for for those of you that have seen Avengers, there is one small moment in that that movie. Where he looks at Hulk, Captain America, and says, Hulk, smash. And that is exactly <laughs> what you see going on with Centurion. I loved reading everything about that character. And there were some, you know, several great new characters in in the book. Was, was he the favorite one for you to write, the favorite new character? Or was there another character that you enjoyed writing more than Centurion? Mm-hmm. This... This might actually be a little bit of a, a surprise. My my favorite characters, and I don't, I don't know if I can say to write because they haven't had a lot to be written about so far. Um, I mean, my, my favorite characters to establish are the Bachma prisoners who escaped with Tawhon. Um I know they just appear as, as some names uh, in this book, and maybe there's a little bit, but... These are going to be some some fun characters. These are really going to be some some very different, very unique characters. Talking about uh, Wutil, talking about um, Nagog, Crash Nagoon, uh, all these different tortured prisoners of war. Um, you know, they're going to be so. Much, I'm so looking forward to del- diving into them. But so far as a character to write. Definitely, Centurion uh, is a, a blast to write. Um, it was it was nice writing Natalie and Logan. Uh, you know, those are two characters with with such a strong relationship, uh, and uh, I think that gets felt even though Logan doesn't have the largest amount of of uh, screen time, quote unquote, uh, in in this book. Um, they were fun. I mean, I love all the characters, so it, it's kind of it's a hard question to answer. I love my two Athene, uh, Ed and Jubajai. Uh, I think they're they're awesome. So, you know, I Jubajai, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've nicknamed Jubajai Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, every character is 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 fun to write in their own way, and I kind of felt like I got to almost make some old characters new and how much they had grown and developed in this book. Uh, I really felt like this is almost the first real look at Boris as a character. Uh, beyond just going oil the door, Boris, he has his moments in this book that he has not had in previous uh, books. Um same thing I would say for Svetlana. Uh, you 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 start to see Svetlana become you know. I love Svetlana. She's a great she's a great character. She's an underappreciated character. I think she uh, has so much mystery about her. Like you don't know anything about her. It's kind of like the equivalent of why. Esther was trying to figure out why she loved Scott. She couldn't come up with a single reason. And then when you try to figure out why Sveta and Scott love each other, there's so there's so many different directions that you could go 
And I just that I'm sorry that aside from the alien war, that is just a fan fantastic part of the series and it's it's part of it's like one of my favorite storylines to read i'm not gonna lie and it's not just because i'm a girl it's <laughs> it's it's interesting because it's unexpected yeah I'll tell um, you, I'll, real quickly i'll tell you something that i'm interested in it's it's uh mentioned briefly briefly in the story but i wonder what william harbinger is going to do mm-hmm because he's this, you know, this big lug that never says the right things, but he's 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 a real person that's really hurting now. And 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 to see what's going to 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 come out of his character or what he's going to do, uh, I'm interested in in seeing that. Will is it's it's what what has happened to Will is truly truly a sad thing for him. Uh, he, he's basically lost everyone that he came with to Nova Sabir's. Up until this point, Will has been comic relief uh, to a, a big extent. And, you know, there's always going to be that element of William Harbinger. But he just lost his best friend. And shortly before that, he lost his other best friend. And so, yeah, he, he's, he's friends with everyone in the 14th. He's, he's comrades with them. He's in their unit. But he's still like their adopted, uh, adopted son, adopted demolitionist. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, he is a character that's going to be doing a, a lot of, a lot of growing up, but he's still going to be William Carpenter, definitely. Yes. Well, that sounds about like a good place to stop for this week. We've we've been chatting for quite some time, and we could continue to chat for much longer. Why don't we Why don't we do it again sometime, Lee? Sounds good. All right, and make sure you guys, if you have any questions of your own to to ask Lee, please get in touch with Derek or I. Um, we will ask your questions. We will give give Lee your thoughts, give him your feedback. I mean, I know he loves to hear us yammer on, but I'm sure he'd love to hear some other insights <laughs> from other fans. So get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. And Lee, I've definitely got some other stuff that I w- I'd like to talk to you about next week. So or next yeah, time. So good. hopefully, hopefully we can snag you for another podcast. Sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, until next week, guys. We will talk to you then. Keep the forums popping and keep in touch with us. Let us know what you think and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the Epic Universe Podcast. To catch the latest word on Epic, join the community at www.epicuniverse.com. 